Welcome to Look, Look and Look Again, where we go all retro and revisit all things culty and hip. Let me take this opportunity to guide you into TV and film of yesteryear, where it was daring, innovative and progressive, and no snowflake or member of the white middle class liberal elite interfered in broadcasting or cinema in their personal crusade for the cause of political correctness all these times. My aim is to cover and look at film and TV with a cult slant and share my passion, knowledge and some facts with you along the way. So on episode 9 we have something for the lefties as we look at communist sci-fi from 1960. So we can look, look and look again at a little known slice of left-wing space age celluloid. So without further ado, it's... Quite recently, I was inspired from an article in a magazine on Ruski science fiction. Um, I thought I'd explore this genre, to be honest with you, because I read it at great interest and uh, I tried to scour as much resources that I had available, whether this was on YouTube or whether this was downloading or buying the actual DVDs themselves to get a real good idea of um, socialist science fiction that was seen through the eyes of those behind the Iron Curtain. And to be honest with you, I'm glad I did. I've witnessed some awesome and thought-provoking stuff from a clandestine era, which basically shows you the perception from an, uh, another angle completely from um, without uh, looking it through uh, Western eyes. It was good to see it through uh, socialist eyes as well. So I thought I'd start by looking at uh, Der Schweigende Stern, which translated is The Silent Star, which was an East German Polish movie from 1960. The version I have seen is thankfully the full Region 1 DVD release and not the uh, anglicised stroke Americanized first spaceship on Venus. For a country such as America that was so obsessed at the time with the Cold War, which verged on neurotic paranoia, it's interesting to note that such films were snapped up pretty quickly in order to make a quick dollar in balderdized forms. Other examples like this are the uh, numerous peplum films that we have mentioned previously when we've looked at Giallo that were also obtained um, and uh, butchered by some of the self-same distributors 
And unfortunately, these films were taken, digested, mutilated, and ultimately shat out for drive-in consumption. It's a shame that the originals weren't left alone, but if your audience has the attention span of a gnat, shameless editing is the order of the day, I guess. However, I shouldn't be too hard as some of the uh, Japanese pinky films that I've seen only exist in the sensationalized abridged versions as the original prints went absent without leave. So it has some saving grace, courtesy of a piss poor rehash. Personally, I would rather see the original any day as so would the majority of, um, of, of people that are interested in films. And uh, it gives me great joy to be able to present to you the review of uh, Silent Star based on the unexpurgated 95 minute version. There were rumours that a 130 minute version existed, but this is flimsy hearsay and most likely a fib. Russian and communist orientated science fiction suffered not only in reducing the time and character development, but many scenes were edited and re-dialogued for the American audience. If the leaning especially was heavy on socialist ideology and left-wing propaganda. Silent Star is not particularly overt in this, especially if you are watching it from an enjoyable romp perspective. But if we scratch the surface further, in Silent Star you can see plenty of uh, revere against the A-bomb antics of Uncle Sam. As in a few of these films I've witnessed and Ikari um, XB springs to mind, the American cosmonaut, should he appear, always ends up lambasted or displays shame due to the events in Hiroshima and for the warlike antics of his fellow countrymen. I suppose there is an element of truth here. Silent Star, in its uncut form, runs a decent 15 minutes longer than the American Hack, released as a first spaceship on Venus and distributed by Crown International. The DVD distributor First Run Features has fortunately seen the good sense to present a superb version of the movie for fans of the science fiction genre to appreciate. This is the true Eastern Bloc version, uh, make no mistake about it, and the only way really to see the movie. Silent Star begins in the year 1970 where Earth appears to be a lefty's wet dream, or for our British readers, a real good look into the future if Jeremy Corbyn won the election. Everyone is getting along swimmingly, which is nice to see, as in reality we can uh, all see this is uh, purely an ideal due to multiculturalism being a total failure. In Siberia, miners dig up an artifact called a spool. We gather that in 1908, a spaceship exploded over the Earth, causing a tremendous crater, which initially was thought to be the work of a rogue meteorite. Scientists believe the spool to be Venusian in origin, and the explosion was created by alien technology going awry. Siegt sich einen seltsamen Felsbrocken. Das eigentümliche Aussehen des Blocks erregte die Aufmerksamkeit der Ingenieure. Die Untersuchung zeigte, dass sich im Innern ein Behälter befand, der eine Spule umschloss. Die Analyse ergab, dass jenes Material nie auf unserer Erde hergestellt wurde. Dieses Gebilde wurde nicht von Menschenhand geschaffen. Woher stammte dieser Fund? Da erinnerte man sich eines lange zurückliegenden Ereignisses. In Sibirien wurde im Juni 1908 eine Explosion von der Größe einer Wasserstoffbombenexplosion beobachtet, die im Umkreis von 600 Kilometern sichtbar war. Man nahm an, dass es sich um einen riesigen Meteor handelte. Flugbahn und Einschlagstelle wurden später von sowjetischen Expeditionen gesucht. Man fand jedoch keine Überreste des sogenannten Tungusischen Meteors. Astronomen und Astronauten. An ihrer Spitze der sowjetische Professor Arsenjew, der Mann, der das erste Raumschiff zum Mond steuerte, der Leiter der Internationalen Weltföderation für Raumforschung, gaben eine erste grundsätzliche Erklärung vor der Weltöffentlichkeit ab. 
Aus unseren Berechnungen, die ergänzt und bestätigt wurden durch die Ergebnisse der Mondstation Luna 3, ergibt sich also, der rätselumwobene sogenannte Tungusische Meteor war höchstwahrscheinlich ein glühend abstürzendes Weltraumschiff eines fremden Planeten. Diese Hypothese beschäftigte die Wissenschaft an aller Welt. Sehen Sie, dort erwartet man in New York den amerikanischen Atomphysiker Professor Hawling. After several failed attempts to contact life on Venus, all systems are go for an expedition. A space vessel called Cosmocrator 1 is now intended to fill this purpose as it's rerailed from its intended Mars exploration. The international crew are assembled, as we are told by the female presenter on Earth, who quite frankly needs a shave and provides regular Vox Pop updates. Sehen noch um Interviews bitten. Sie werden 50 Stunden lang in tiefem künstlichen Schlaf liegen, einem Schlaf, der Ihnen allen hilft, Kraft zu sammeln und aufzuspeichern für diesen anstrengenden Flug in den Weltraum. Wir unterbrechen. that they are prestigious cosmonaut professor Arseniev and a nuclear scientist from the USA, Professor Halling. They are joined further by their fellow comrades, Polish engineer Soltik and his robot Amiga. An African called Talua is a communication expert. The Cosmocrator One also has a Japanese doctor called Suniko, played by the beautiful Yoko Tani, who we learn is a widow as her husband died on the moon, and also the machismo element who chases after her, East German cosmonaut Brinkman. The fondness is all too clear on Brinkman's part, but Sumiko spurns his advances at every turn due to her being barren from the radioactivity from the Hiroshima A-bomb. Ooh, there's a bit of a punch in the gut there for the Americans. Uh, with the crew all set, and after a challenging battle with a meteoral storm, the Cosmocrator 1 settles down on Venus. The landscape is bleak apart from a tangle of uh, stanic twisted trees and a multicolored vapor that ebbs and flows across the landscape. It is identified that the trees are radioactive and at one time were used as some sort of energy projector. Sie überlegen sich das. Ja? Nur so ein kleines bisschen Seele. <lacht> Beschleunigungssicherung herausreißen. Omega, four. The first of our intrepid comrades to investigate this terrain is Brinkman, who falls into an underground cave where he encounters some cute metallic insects. Sakana, a mathematician, determines them to be a record of data of Venusian history after he examines them back on board. A small party is sent to explore the planet further and identifies Venus as a planet now partially destroyed by a nuclear catastrophe which happened as they were appear to attack the Earth. Our intrepid cosmonauts also see the ghosts of the Venusians themselves when they venture into the citadel. All that is left of them are the shadows burned into the rocks by atomic blast, another echo of Hiroshima fact. Eventually, 
Umegura, Brinkman and Soltek ascend a coned tower and in the film's standout moment are attacked by green and black ooze. <laughs> protagonists can make it back to Earth and what lessons are to be learned from Venus, preventing our Earth from sharing the same destructive fate. Silent Star worked for me on the two levels. First and foremost, it's a decent, colourful romp and a thought-provoking slice of pure science fiction based on the novel by Stanislav Lem, The Astronauts. The avoidance of BEMs, bug-eyed monsters, is a strength rather than a weakness here. The menace in the story is effective enough without some clawed blob absconding with the screeching heroine. Secondly, it's a really fascinating slice of propaganda done well. If one, as I, has been fed on a diet of American Western ideology, it seems somehow a refreshing change to see into what could be be considered as a socialist utopia. From a film dating back to 1960, important jobs are given to women and even different cultures, so we do not have an advanced way of representation unseen in 1960s American or British film. The odd jab at anti-America is running through the narrative, whether dialogue or in sequence. For example, we learn that before Hauling assisted the mission, he was given a brow beating by his stateside counterparts for abandoning capitalism. There are also references to the barbarity of the USA, especially in the lamentable behaviour of Suniko. As well as her sterility, she also mentions the loss of her parents due to the lingering effects of radiation. It is also Suniko who points out the similarities between the vaporised Venusians and the victims of Hiroshima. Another noteworthy sequence is where um, Hauling uh, challenges Omega to a game of chess and is beaten every turn. Soltik tweaks the robot's programming to eventually let Hauling win a few games. Therefore, we have a theory that to keep an American happy, it's better to let him be the victorious, albeit illusionary. There are a few examples of this, but I will let you notice them when you view the movie, and I strongly recommend that you do. From Silent Star, we understand a clear message that a cosmonaut will explore the stars based on a divine obligation to the motherland and to science as well as the imperialistic pride of quest. The American way is represented by a sole purpose of placing weaponry amongst the stars and to dominate for the ultimate prize. 
to claim the universe as their own. This is pretty poignant stuff, and there again I enforce how invigorating this difference of outlook can be. Other noticeable differences, and you have to bear in mind this is 1960, the role of women are pivotal in the socialist society. The women aren't there to provide coffee and fawn over their big, brave, macho superiors, or to show a bit of tit and being menaced by some tentacle menace. They pioneer, they pilot, they advise, they are equal. I was also surprised at the ethnic diversity, especially in the scenes involving the Science Astronomic Centre on Earth, as people of different creeds and colours attend to the words, clicks and ticker tape demands of computers. Some are even seen in native costume. These are also genuine actors and actresses, not people blacked up. Cannon fodder or and this danger of ethnic roles is apparent even today on television and film the token black to keep the minorities happy. Such moments are unthinkable in any Western equivalent from that time, if I take into consideration the Western equivalents I have seen made in the early 1960s. DEFA, the production company behind this, must have thrown a huge amount of Zelotes at this, and I believe it was one of their most expensive productions. Kudos to the director, Kurt Maitzig, who ensures his vision is maximised in the way he explores the terrain, visually following the cosmonauts every turn and for the viewer's benefit. Maitzig wows us, and with such excellent set design, this proves to be the perfect accompaniment. Despite the austerity of the Venusian landscape, some scenes, courtesy of coloured gels and lighting techniques, are vivid indeed, given a helping hand courtesy of Agfa film stock that brings all the riches of reds, tangerines and turquoise to bold life. Although not psychedelic, it has that wonderful early 60s vibrancy that can be glimpsed in Mario Barber's Hercules in the Haunted World and a certain scale setwise akin to the Forbidden Planet. This makes Silent Star a bit of a feast for the eyes. The story itself, as mentioned, is adapted from Astronauts, the Astronauts, a 1951 novel by famous sci-fi writer Stanislav Lem. Lem provides quite a few storylines that were ultimately adapted into screen realizations within the Iron Curtain's film industry, most notable, of course, being Tarkovsky's 1970 science fiction film Solaris. Unfortunately, he washed his hands of this and hated it, believing it to be irreverent in comparison to the novelization. I am unsure whether this differs dramatically from his published story, as I haven't read the book, but may do in future and may report back at some stage. Fundamentally, though, Silent Star is presented in all its glory as intended and proves to be a real revelation, irrespective of what the viewer's political leanings are. It ticks most boxes for me, and for those of you that have only seen First Spaceship on Venus in a print that looks like it has been through the washing machine, panned and scanned, cut and dubbed, this is a total discovery on how different a film can be when given the dedication and respect it rightly deserves. The film was even used in Mystery Science Theatre in its poorest version, I gather. I did not see this episode as I feel this series is about as funny as a terminal illness and, to be frank, utter crap. So any of you with this version known as First Spaceship on Venus should bin it straight away. Now you can see an example of a decent science fiction laden with heavy overtones of Eastern Bloc credo that can come across just as alien as the destination of the Cosmocrator one. Well, that wraps up this show. So I'm looking forward uh, to sharing some more thrills and spills with you in episode 10. Would you believe it's our uh, 10th episode? Some time go by quick. Okay, so I look forward to chatting away with you then and uh, joining you for another episode of Look, Look and Look Again. Until then, cheerio. First spaceship on Venus. You are there with eight international astronauts, seven men and a woman, taking off on the most exciting nerve-shattering journey in the history of man. You are there, braving the staggering shower of meteorites. You are there for the magic of the giant motion picture screen.
takes you 36 million miles into outer space. There's never been anything like this before in fact or fiction. First spaceship on Venus. Thank <laughs> you. 